Thank you for uh, praying for me. Two weeks ago, I uh, was in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, we had put the, uh, my mom had passed away in October. I've told you this, and she passed away. She had Alzheimer's. And uh, you know what? It's It was just, uh, we, we decided that we were going to put the service off till after, you know, travel became more. Uh, and and we, we would give it time for better weather in Nashville. <laughs> Folks, I'm going to tell you something, it rained. <laughs> well, it, it, it was mud. It was, well, it was a little muddy, but it was okay. We, we made it to the service. Thank you. And last week, um, folks, they, they said I had a stroke. And um, that, uh, I was in the hospital, and they said I had a stroke. And so, have you ever been in the hospital, didn't sleep, uh, didn't rest, didn't relax, and uh, got out of the hospital and was talking to a, a friend uh, who was a doctor, he said, it didn't sound to me like you had a stroke. And I said, well, anyway, have you ever tried to get an appointment with a neurologist? Not, not good. Anyway, folks, do you realize as a church what you guys have done? I mean, really, y'all called a pastor. Uh, y'all, y'all have given generously. Look, at, I just looked at last week's giving in, in the worship guy, and it, it's good. And, and y'all are just being faithful, and thank you so much uh, for, for doing all that. And, uh, you know, it's just a church that's moving forward and, and seeking the Lord. And I, I just am grateful for that. And, and I'll say this, too. We need to pray that God would lead a worship leader our way. Now, I know Bobby doesn't mind leading worship, and I certainly don't ever have to do it. I'll do it. But um, <laughs> I don't know. I will, I will do it. But... Um, Folks, you never know what God has, and and we we want the person that God wants for us, okay? And that's what we want. Now, our, our message today is going to come from um, Philippians chapter three, and um, what we're going to do today is talk about the future. Do you know how much money people make? making predictions about the future, futurologists. I, I, look, as, as a young pastor, I remember this was back in 1986. And yes, I was a young pastor back in 1986. And I want to tell you something. That didn't seem like that long ago to me, but I'm told it was. Um, I, I got a book, free of charge, by the way, for pastors. The rapture is going to happen in 1987. Do you all remember that book? And, and, and folks, do you know if, if the rapture happened and the church was raptured and, and Jesus would return, that, that the future, boy, it, it, it would be much, much different for planet Earth than it has been. Okay. There, guess what happened in 1988? Or 1987, I'm sorry. Nothing. I got a, got, a, got a letter. Same author. Stating that he had been wrong. That he had done miscalculations. And that the rapture was going to happen in 1988. Remember this? Guess what? He published another book. And the rapture didn't happen. In 1988. Now, I wonder what that guy made off his book sales. I, I have no idea. I've never asked. I was thinking about that this week. But, folks, people make a lot of money talking about the future. We want to know what's going to happen in the future. I guess it's because we're unhappy today. I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen in the future. I can tell you with pretty good certainty that it's not going to snow here tomorrow. Pretty good. I can't tell you absolutely. Hey, folks, I've seen snow flurries in, 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 in Orlando. Have you? Years ago. So, Christmas Eve, never forget. Snow flurries. It was cold, too. 
But I don't know what's going to happen in the future, and neither do you. You can plan for it. You can anticipate it. But you know what's going to happen. How many wish 20 years ago you would invest a little money in Apple stock? Well, there's not a one of us. Or just maybe a couple years ago in Tesla stock. But we didn't. And you know what? Some of us still want to live there. But we have no control of the future. And you know what else some people live? Unfortunately, they live in the past. Now look, they, they allow their life to be defined by something that happened in the past. Hey, I'm, I don't know. I haven't been there. I haven't walked in your shoes. But good things happen in the past and bad things happen in the past. But folks, we can't live in the past. We can learn from the past. But we can't live in there. Learn and live are two very, very different things. We can't live in the future. We can't live in the past. Where do we live today? But you see, Paul in Philippians chapter 3, what he does is he writes to the church at Philippi. Um, and he tells the Philippians people, he said, look, you don't have any control of the future. But you can face whatever happens, <coughs> pardon me, with confidence. Notice what he says in verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because the Lord has control of the future. Here's that word again that we've seen time and time again. Joy or rejoice in Philippians. Now remember, Paul was in jail when he wrote this. In fact, he had written the letter mainly as a thank you note because Epaphroditus had brought him an offering for the church of Philippi. Remember that? And, and so he was writing them and saying, look, whatever happens, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write this same thing to you again. And it is a safeguard. Here's that word, safeguard, confidence, right? Protect yourselves. Be smart. Be wise. Watch out for those dogs. Now, can you imagine? Paul is telling the Philippians to watch out for the dogs. Now, what was he talking about? Dogs who run the streets? Stray dogs? Domestic dogs? No, he's talking about dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. Now, look, in, in that day and time, the church was new. And, and, and there were some who thought that in order to be a complete Christian, you had to accept Christ, plus you had to go through all the rites of Judaism. A part of that is circumcision, right? In fact, it was a sign to the Jewish people uh, that a Jewish male be circumcised. We'll, we'll see more about that in just, in just a minute. And uh, if a male weren't circumcised, it meant he, weren't, he was not a Jew. And throughout Paul's ministry, there were this group of people, um, these teachers, Paul calls them, who taught what he calls evil. He calls them dogs. And what they do is mutilate the flesh. For it is those who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Jesus Christ, and who put no circumcision in the flesh. Now look, the Bible says that as Christians, as believers, we are circumcised in, in the heart. Okay? It, it, it's an outward circumcision that matters. It, it's an inward circumcision that, that happens in the heart, that happens in the life of the believer. The outside symbol for the believer is baptism. You know, I should bury with Christ in baptism, raised to walk into his life. Symbol of death, burial, and resurrection. It's not circumcision. And you see, there were some who taught that you had to be, you had to believe in Jesus, plus you had to do this too. Now, look, folks, can I just say this too? There are some who teach that, oh, you have to believe in Jesus today, but you have to live a certain lifestyle. 
Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. Do this, do this, do this, do this. Jesus plus, okay? No, it's Jesus, period. According to the Bible, it's Jesus. And what Jesus did, period. Not Jesus plus anything. Okay? Now, Paul says you got to watch out for him. Because there are people everywhere that teach that. But whatever happens, whatever you hear, be ready for it. And he was. He was encouraged believers to be. He said you have to develop a proper perspective toward the future, but you also have to develop a proper perspective toward the past. Now, remember, he's dealing with the issue of circumcision. And though he says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. Listen to the way he says now. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe or the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisees, as for zeal, practicing, or persecuting the church, as for legalistic, righteousness, faultless. Paul says, look, if anyone has any reason to put confidence in the flesh, I do. I did all these things, but it didn't make me right with God. I did everything a Jew should do, a good Hebrew should do. But he said it wasn't enough. If anybody, he says, has any reason to put confidence in the flesh, he said, I do. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever known anybody, and I hope nobody in here is guilty of living in the past, of your past accomplishments and past deeds. Have you ever done that? Have you ever known anybody like that? Hey, folks, I want to tell you something. My senior year in high school, when we upset the state reigning champions in football, I played really good in that game. In fact, the more I tell the story, the better I get. Right? Or it's like a fisherman. Have you ever known someone to fish? The more they tell the story, the bigger the fish gets or the more it weighs. There's something about that. I'll tell you something. The past doesn't matter. What you've done in the past how God has used you in the past, you learn from it. You give thanks for it, but you move forward. You don't live there. Paul says, look, all his accomplishments. But what does he say? For whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss. For the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss. In verse 9. Compared to the passing greatness of knowing Christ. <clears throat> In perspective, he says, I did all these things. But nothing. Notice what else he says. I consider them rubbish. Now, do you know what the Greek word for rubbish is? Garbage. <laughs> Just teasing. Hey, look, folks, rubbish. The same thing you and I had at our house. Same thing I get hauled off twice a week. The same thing I put in a plastic bag in the house and take outside and put in the trash can. All your good deeds are all Paul's good deeds. He says we're lost. I count them rubbish. <coughs> rubbish compared to what? Gaining Christ. Notice what he says in here. But that which the faith is Christ, the comes from faith from God and is by faith. Now those notice what he said. Look at verse 10. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of resurrection. Now look. That's what Paul was counting on. Not what Paul had done in the past, but what Jesus had done for Paul, right? I want to be found in him. Paul said. Not, not in, I want, I'm, look, folks, what, what do we want to be known by? Our, our success? How, how many times 
I do all the time. I read stuff in the paper about things in the past. It just interests me. But it's in the past. It's about people's accomplishments. And and the older I get, as a kid, the people I knew, the football players as I knew are, are, are leaving. They're passing away. Or the, or the baseball players, the basketball players, the movie stars. They're just kind of and a whole new generation that I really don't know is, is coming up and taking their place. Paul says, more than anything, I want to be found in Jesus. And he goes on, I want to know Christ. Look, if you ask me what I want in life, I want to know Christ. And he says, I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Now, look, do you know that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead after three days is available in your life and in my life today. Did you know that? But see, we don't, we, we're not really sure about that. Or we're not really believing that. Or we, we would ask God to do greater things. Not necessarily great in terms of what God said. Remember, Paul was in jail. Don't you think for a minute that Paul could have prayed himself out of jail? But while he was in jail, he witnessed he witnessed people that came into the guards. I mean, those, Paul says in, in another book, those in Caesar's household greet you. <laughs> well, how do you think those in Caesar's household heard the gospel? <laughs> Through Paul's time in jail. That's how they heard. Now look, I want to know Christ. It doesn't mean to know about him. It means to know him personally. I want to know Christ. You see, knowing Christ has nothing to do with the accumulation of knowledge. Yeah, the more we know about Jesus, the better off we are. That's true. However, to know Christ personally. See, look. Let me tell you this. At 18 years old, I became a believer. I became a child of God. I became a Christian. I had been in church all my life. I knew about Jesus. I had an intellectual understanding about Jesus. But I didn't know him. I didn't. But then I got to know him personally at 18. I, 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 I knew something about Mark. I, I knew that Mark Matheson was a sinner. But, but I know that Jesus loved me anyway. I know that Mark Matheson, me, was empty on the inside. <coughs> Good things on the outside, but on the inside I knew. You know what? Just kind of going through the motions. But then I found Jesus. And he changed my life. Now, you see, as, as I look at today, and, and I look at tomorrow, something's got to drive us. we got to look for, and live for something. And what Paul says, not that I've already attained all this, or have already been made perfect or complete, what did he do? I press on. I press on. Paul uses the language of an athlete running a race. I press on. And he later on, he uses the word strain. Have you ever seen an athlete strain for the finish line? When, when an athlete is running a race to, to strain to finish first. That, that's the image he uses. That with everything Paul has, what he wants to do is to, is to know Christ. And he wants to grow. Now, look, Paul was a, was a mature believer. Paul had grown a lot. Paul had read most of the New Testament. Paul had been on a mission, three, three missionary journeys. Paul was in jail for his faith. Paul had seen hundreds and hundreds come to know Christ. Paul had discipled. But that wasn't enough for Paul. Paul wanted to grow. He wanted to press on. The Bible says he wanted to strain. And he could face whatever happened 
in the midst of that with confidence. Why? Because he knew his destination. Look at what his destination is. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. Paul knew where he was going. He, he knew what his destination was. He knew what his prize was. And folks, I want to tell you this. He, he could deal with anything that came his way. And so can you and so can I. Look, I'm going to tell you something. Grief is not easy. L trust me, losing my spouse eight years ago wasn't easy. I sat across the table and forgave the person. But, but I knew where she was. Sit, sitting at home for six months and going from a hospital bed to a wheelchair to a walker to a cane from a handicap sticker to not having one. I'd like to get the handicap sticker back some, sometimes. Wouldn't you? When you're parking, there, yeah, that's another story. But uh, maybe I'll get it. <laughs> anyway, look. But, but, I, but I realize that I can face anything. After having gone through an experience like that, what more is there that can happen? Look, I don't know where you've been. I don't know what's happened in the past. I don't know. But God does, and you do. But you're still here. <laughs> you're still upright. You're still mobile. You're still breathing. You're still alive. And, and hopefully you know what your prize is and, and what your destination is. And, and notice how Paul concludes this section. All of us who are mature, he says, mature is simply a word that means complete. All of us who are mature, not immature, should take such a view of things. And he said, look, look, this is good. And if some of you think differently, God, too, will point that out to you. <laughs> Have you ever tried to change someone's mind? Folks, I, I gave up trying to change people's minds. Hey, I, you know what? I, I can tell people they're sinners. I can tell people they're going to hell. But, but it doesn't work. I, for me, it doesn't. It might work for you. But, but you know what? When God starts to work in their lives... I'm not saying God doesn't work through Mark. He does. I'm not saying that God doesn't work through you. He does. <coughs> but remember who's doing the work. God works in you. And God works through you. To will and to act according to his good purpose. You're not responsible. I, can I tell you this? I'm going to let you off the hook. You're not responsible if someone accepts or rejects Jesus Christ. You know, you know that, don't you? You're not responsible. They make that decision. If someone is lost, are you responsible for that? If, if someone is saved, are you are you responsible for that? No, you're not. Jesus, is. the Holy Spirit in them is responsible. Period. Only if someone is with a perfect person, please stand. No. Paul wasn't perfect. If you think Paul was perfect, read Romans chapter 7. Where he says, I find myself doing the very thing I don't want to do. Fine. Read it if you don't believe it. But you know what? He was mature enough to know he wasn't. And he was mature enough to know that the only way to please God, Jesus. And, and the only way that you and I can please God today is to bring all our energy to bear on living today. Hey, I can't live in the past. Remember, I can learn for it. 
learn from it. Can't live in the future. I can plan for it. But today, I can live. And you know what? So can you. <laughs> and we all should. That's what Paul has to say in this section of Philippians chapter 3. He writes them to let them know, this is what I'm going to focus on. This is what I can control. A lot of things I can't. It really doesn't matter. And you know what? The same thing is true for us today. Confidence as we face the future. Whatever happens, whatever comes, let's pray. Father God, give us that kind of confidence that